Good evening, everyone, and welcome to By the Book, a celebration of research and writing and the grand reopening of the Western Reserve Historical Society Library. My name is Regina Williams, and it's been my pleasure to serve as host for each of the scholarly presentations. The first one took place on Thursday, October 7th, and this final one is taking place on Thursday, April 7th of National Minority Health Month. So certainly special welcome and special thanks to Dr. Gregory Hall. And we also want to say happy birthday to Mrs. Melanie Hall. That makes our time together this evening even more special because we know that uh, Dr. Hall has made time in his busy schedule to join on, us on the evening of his wife's birthday. So thank you to the entire Hall family. It's important that we're able to get um, the very best video possible via Zoom because we would like very much to invite our team of master teachers, all of them licensed educators here in the state of Ohio to take a look at the video, to read the book, and then offer suggestions to me and other colleagues at the Western Reserve Historical Society for how we might best share this information with students of all ages here in the state of Ohio or wherever else people have access to the videos. Once we upload the information to the Historical Society's YouTube channel. So without any further delays, I'd like to read to you an excerpt from a detailed press release that includes biographical sketch for Dr. Gregory Hall. A newly hired University Hospital's primary care physician with a 30 year history of public health advocacy, particularly focusing on Black Americans, has been appointed the first medical director of the University Hospital's Cutler Center for Men. Gregory Hall, MD, is an internal medicine physician practicing at UH Richmond Medical Center. The new role through the Cutler Center, which helps men navigate the health system to access the resources and experts they need, will complement his role as a primary care physician, PCP. Dr. Hall will help to coordinate, develop, and implement protocols to ensure the delivery of highly specialized quality care through the Cutler Center's medical team. A native of Cleveland, Dr. Hall is a Cleveland Clinic trained internal medicine specialist who has practiced in Cleveland since 1994. Currently, he is an associate professor in both the internal medicine and integrative medical sciences departments at the Northeast Ohio Medical University. He was a governor appointed member of the Ohio Commission on Minority Health and served as chairman for many years. He currently serves as the board president of the Cuyahoga County Board of Health. Recently, Dr. Hall established the National Institute for African American Health, which will mentor the next generation of minority physicians and advocate for better health outcomes for African Americans. And again, uh, this is, um, going to look like a commercial and maybe it is. Here's uh, the book that we're going to focus on for tonight's presentation by Dr. Hall and our discussion. If members of the audience have questions, the title again, Patient-Centered Clini Clinical Care for African Americans, a concise evidence-based guide to important differences and better outcomes. Thank you so much, Dr. Hall, for joining us. Well, thank you very much for, for having me. I appreciate the uh, the introduction. I, as I said, I, I prefer briefer ones, but I appreciate it. And, and uh, I'm happy to be here virtually. And um, I am not ignoring my wife's birthday. We are going out. We have eight o'clock uh, reservations, which I will make. <laughs> I will absolutely, we will absolutely make uh, for tonight. And so uh, we were going to have a date night and actually come out to the museum when this was initially 
uh, plan, but now it's remote. We're st it's still not derailing our plan. So, but I, but I was happy to happy to be here. So, real quick, we're gonna gotta go over like why is patient centered clinical care for African Americans relevant? Why you know why actually have have us come together to talk about this in a in a in a way like this? And because, well, because Ohio's demographics are are deceptive. Thirteen percent of of um, Ohio's population is African American, and that seems like a low number, but I'll show you that that's really sort of deceptive. Um, the clinical outcomes for African Americans are, are poor and then they are the worst. And we'll look at some approaches to improved care, uh, mostly related to trust, uh, to improving quality outcomes, and then some of the evidence-based uh, sort of preferred treatments that, that um, I've outlined in my book. So let's look at the Ohio demographics, 13% is deceptive. And so if you look at, again, I mentioned uh, Ohio is 13% African-American, 81% white, 4% Hispanic Latino, and then the Asian Pacific Islanders around 2%. And so uh, that number overall is, um, is also similar to um, Ohioans with Medicare. But people with Medicare all turn 65 at the same age. And so again, you'll see 80% white, 13% African-American. But if you look at Medicaid, which uh, cares for poor, and disabled uh, um, Americans, 29% of Ohio of Ohio's Medicaid rank is African American com compared to 67% white. And so that just shows that this disproportionate increase in disease, that 13% going to 29% because people are disabled, people are poor, that's, a, that's an increased burden. And if you look, again, looking at different states, I just show Ohio at 29%, 30%, Oklahoma 12%, Oregon 4%, you know, that's that's the percent of African Americans. And so Ohio has a high number, almost a third, and their overall budget. If you look at and I never knew about these things. If you look at Ohio's overall budget, 42% is K through 12 education. 10% uh, is higher education like universities like Cleveland State. And Medicaid is 21%. So again, if 21% of the entire Ohio budget is Medicaid, then a third of that is dedicated to African-American health. And that's why it's everyone's um, issue to remember. And that just kind of, this kind of shows all that, that outline there. And then who knew um, that Ohio ranks 11th in terms of an African-American population? And again, I, I didn't know that, but just in terms of the pure number of African-Americans here. Who also knew that Cleveland was a majority uh, African-American city, a 51% of, of the population of Cleveland, Ohio is, is African-American. In Cincinnati, it's 43%. Columbus, 28%. Dayton, almost 40%. Toledo, 27%. Youngstown, 43%. Again, I had no clue living in Cleveland, born and raised, that 43% of the residents of, of Youngstown are African-American. And so if you look at this map that was kind of done through um, uh, the census, and you'll see the darker areas are where African-Americans live. African-Americans tend to live in urban areas in those big cities. And so again, this, this just shows the population, Cleveland, Lorraine, Sandusky, Toledo, all there. And then in looking the rural areas, not very many. So again, 13% overall, but if you go into a waiting room in Cleveland or Columbus, and you're going to see 40, 50 percent of the people in that waiting room as African Americans. And I tell the medical students, when you work at these hospitals, half the patients you see are going to be African Americans, not 13 percent, like you know, like like the overall population demographics would suggest, but half. And so it's very deceiving, uh, and and there's significant spending that's going from Medicaid do do uh, dollars, which is coming from our tax dollars, that's going to, at times, inefficient care. And so there are endeavors we can do to kind of improve the, the care that we deliver to this population. So the clinical outcomes for African Americans are absolutely the worst. And this we're starting with this, this um, sort of mental exercise, thought activity I want you to look at. Um, this is life expectancy by race. And then just look at that. One is 74.8, two is 78.5, three, 81.8, and four is 86.5. So I want you to mentally sort of assign uh, the, the racial and ethnic group to the life expectancy on that bar. And so you already know the worst, African-Americans have the worst outcomes. So I'll spot you that number one 
is African Americans at 74.8. And unfortunately, that's even gone down since the, uh, the COVID outbreak. But, but mentally assign who's two? Is that Asian Pacific Islanders, white Americans, Hispanic Latino Americans? Who's three and who's four? So just kind of take a second and uh, guess who that is. Who's two? Who's three? And who lives the longest at 86.5? And I give this talk all the time and I guarantee you, it's never what people expect because white Americans are actually number two at 78.5. Hispanic Latino uh, Americans are 81.8, lifespan average, men and women combined, and the Asian Pacific Islanders are 86.5. And so when I was on the Commission for Minority Health, I was frequently asked to speak about health disparities. And, and I believed, probably like many of you, that minorities had poor outcomes and the majority of white Americans had the best outcomes, but that's not exactly true. African Americans have a disproportionately low poor outcomes. And in reality, Asian Pacific Islanders live eight years longer uh, than white Americans. So when I took the position at, at Cutler Center for Men, I actually was looking at health disparities as, as for that as well, because there's a significant disparity uh, and, and increased disease burden, believe it or not, for white people with increased cancer, et cetera. So it's, 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 it, and it's not advertised very much. Now, when we separate men from women, I know people don't like bar graphs, but again, I was raised to believe that women live longer than men, right? And so at the far left, you'll see the African-American, um, you know, men have the worst, like myself, have the worst outcomes and you see women right next to it. But again, if you follow that bar across women, African-American women don't live as long as Native American men, Hispanic, Latino men, or Asian Pacific Islander men. And so that kind of goes against. And then if you compare, again, African-American women to men in other countries, African-American women don't live as long as the men in Switzerland, and France, the United Kingdom. So this is something that, that really contributes to a disadvantage. And the, the number one thing that contributes to uh, African-American disadvantage is heart disease and stroke, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but also cancer and homicide and diabetes and then perinatal issues. That's that infant mortality issues that we've talked about in the past. So African-Americans have the worst outcomes as it relates to cardiovascular disease. 321 per 100,000, way over what's in second place, 245. And so that increased heart and stroke, and stroke burden is what's really taken most of its toll. But also in terms of diabetes, African Americans have much more diabetes. But right behind us, Native Americans have uh, increased uh, diabetes. And you can see the rest of the numbers there. And in terms of the cancer outcomes, African Americans have the worst outcomes with breast cancer, ovarian, cervical, colon, prostate, pancreatic, liver thyroid and head and neck cancer. So what's not there, I, I amended these, this, these uh, slides in January because we went into second place in terms of lung cancer. After whites have a higher burden and higher mortality for lung cancer compared to African Americans. We're now in a very close second place. Um, but, but so it, otherwise, it, the worst uh, cancer outcomes for any cancer that would come to mind, basically. I'm looking at this, this graph, this shows the increased burden that lung cancer has going from left to count, going from left to right. Lung cancer is the first bar. Colon cancer is the second bar. Breast cancer is the third. The light blue is pancreatic cancer and uh, prostate cancer is that hash bar. And so you've got all the populations on the left, whites next, blacks next, and then Hispanic, Latinos, Asian Pacific Islanders aren't even on this. And so just eyeballing it from afar, you see that with this, unfortunately, it still shows like the blacks are, have the worst outcomes for lung cancer, but they've inched up. But if again, looking at um, colon cancer, much bigger differences for each of those cancers as you go across the slide. So, but there are many opportunities for us to improve care and the improved care is really based on three different things. We can improve the, 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 the provider patient relationship, which I, frequently see patients, I went to the doctor, he didn't listen to me, he didn't sit down, he didn't, you know, the, the trust issues, gaining knowledge about certain differences that occur as it relates to, um, to, to clinical outcomes and clinical care, and then making sure that we're delivering evidence-based care, right? And so that just graphic just sort of shows that. And so the main thing, low trust leads to poor compliance. And so I always talk about having a low 
I had a poor sense of direction, right? And I'd always get lost before GPS, Greg Hall was lost. I'd always have to start at a gas, stop at a gas station and find out what's the direction. And if, and if I didn't trust the directions that the gas station attendant gave me, I'd nod yes. And then I'd walk outside and get in the car and say, no, I'm gonna stop someplace else and ask for better instructions. Well, unfortunately, patients are doing the exact same thing. And so if they'll smile at their doctors, but if, but if they don't trust them, they're not going to um, they're not going to accept the recommendation. And so this study by Marie Brown showed that if we could just improve uh, medication adherence, how patients take their medications, we we would improve a whole lot as it relates to overall health. And so this graph just shows that you know if people took their heart failure medicine and their hypertension medicine, their diabetes medicine, like they're supposed to, there'd be some increased costs rate associated with that but the savings from not being in the, being hospitalized for infections and diabetics and congestive heart failure exacerbations and whatnot are tremendous. And so as we try to look at uh, discovering new medications and new approaches to this and that as it relates to heart disease and diabetes, we really need to be you know, spending time trying to build trust between patients and, and, and providers so they can just take the medicine we've already discovered, the medicines that are already out there. And so another, uh, Dr. Halbert studied, uh, published a study in JAMA, which is a, a major journal in, in medicine in 2006 and looked at trust issues. And between 100 African-Americans and 500 white Americans, they found that African-Americans report, tend to report m more low trust. They tend to be less trusting of providers. So that was sort of documented. And then another, uh, Dr. Bolwell looked and then confirmed again, low trust, disproportionately low trust in African-Americans compared to whites and, and Hispanic Latinos and Asian Pacific Islanders as well, as well as elevated concerns about personal privacy and the potential for experimentation. And so it's like, you know, they, we kind of come in. And so I've walked into an exam room on many occasions and saw someone looking at me just like this young lady is looking at her provider and I've seen it so many times and I used to wonder what what did I do I haven't even met you and you're looking at me like I'm crazy and because I didn't know about this data and a lot of doctors don't know that that the, the patients come in with an attitude just based on a whole lot of history that, that they didn't know and I didn't know either even as an African-American physician I don't get a manual on that right I have to learn it like everybody else and then, and then once you know, then you know that it's a thing. So Tuskegee syphilis study, we've been talking about it more. Sometimes people get the data wrong. And so I wanted to take a chance to really opportunity rather to really kind of go through the, the particulars of it because it's important, right? Uh, it went from 1932 to 1972. It was sponsored by the US Public Health Service. And so I tell people at the Cuyahoga County Board of Health uh, when you're knocking on the door, an African-American's door, and they, you say, it's the, well, we're here with the public health, and you think you're coming to help, they see something totally different. They have a history that's totally different. So people don't trust the U.S. government, the health service, because that's what was done. 600 men total, 400 with syphilis, 200 without. No one was injected with syphilis. No one was given syphilis. The men just had syphilis. And at the time, in 1932, when it was started, there was no treatment for syphilis. And so um, it was a reasonable study to do because there was no treatment. We're just going to follow what happens when there's none. It was specifically for colored people, as you see there, for African-Americans. And so, and, and they were not dis disclosing what the, what the purpose of it was. It was perfectly reasonable until 10 years into the study from 1932 to 1942. In 1942, penicillin was widely available and penicillin is the cure for syphilis. And so they turned left, a hard left in the study and decided that they were not going to communicate, um, they weren't gonna give the, the, the cure for the study that they were doing because they did, the study took precedent over the patients. And that went on for 30 years, for an additional 30 years until 1972, when basically a, a, an author uh, with New York Times wrote a study and outed them and what they and what they had done. And at that point, the study was halted. And so the victims, all African Americans, numerous men, uh, 40 wives who contracted disease, 19 children born, born with congenital syphilis, which I can't even put slides of that in the slide. It's so it's so hideous. And and the process of, of keeping it a secret 
meant that everyone, every doctor in the Tuskegee area had to know who were the men in the study so that if they presented, they didn't accidentally give them penicillin and treat them for it. They had to know who the wives were. So if the wives presented, they did treat the wives, but they didn't tell them that they had syphilis. So there, I'm, I'm giving you a treatment for something that I'm not telling you have, therefore you can't prevent yourself from getting it again. It's just, it's just a, a, a global mess, right? And, and because of all that. So that's where privacy, you know, every emergency room, every hospital and every doctor in the area knew who these men were, knew not to treat them, knew to treat their family members and their associations and still not tell anyone anything. And so you wonder whether, uh, well, it's been a long time. It ended in 1972. What's the big deal now, right? It's 2022. Well, Johns Hopkins looked at the awareness of it and found 81% of African-Americans were aware, whereas 28% had no any knowledge of the study. Um, shifting gears to J. Marion Sims, the father of, of gynecology. Um, he basically, um, a, a scientist and researcher in his heart, documented everything, and he documented all the surgeries he did on unanesthetized slave girls. And so he, um, he did surgeries over and over trying to perfect uh, these different gynecological surgeries. If you can imagine um, over and over again, there's no issue whether he did it because he was such the scientist, quote unquote, and that he documented who he did the surgery on, what the surgery was, none of their, ne never was their anesthesia done. And so as time wore on, People wanted to know, should there be a statue of him in Central Park? Should there be statues of him in, in the South as whether because because the gains that kind of came from his surgical his surgical prowess, right? But at what the what the cost of, of all the screams and, and the pain that came from from having surgery and not being anesthetized, uh, which was available. So it's just it's just um, it's you know it's, it's just a terrible thing. And so so that you know in reality they have refused. Uh, uh, removed some of his um, some of his statues. So who knew also about um, where you got bodies from medical school back in the 60s and 70s and 40s and 30s, right? Uh, and so it turns out, of course, uh, the medical schools would um, would rob graves, and usually black graves or Potter Field um, um, poor graves, in order to um, have their students learn. Um, you know, uh, uh, cadavers, learn anatomy, right? And so it, this, this has been documented over and over again. And it was a thing, whereas you would go out to a black or poor uh, grave and then they would steal the bodies um, and then um, dissect them. And then there would be a mass grave associated with the medical school. And this is, again, imagine your mother, your father, your husband or wife dying and you go back to the cemetery a week later and and someone has dug them up and take them and you know who it is not you're not wondering who it is it's the medical school in the next town and a medical student that did it and so that colors when you go see a doctor you know someone like you probably dug up my brother or my sister or my son god forbid you know and so it's it, and this this goes on and on and so and even with georgia medical college uh grandison harris who, who's this gentleman right here who better to go to a black uh, cemetery and and in the night than a black person. And so this person would not be in the graduating class for Georgia picture for a Georgia Medical College unless he was critical to to their um, to their education. And you see him in the center in the back, but in the center of that picture. And so he, he apparently stole just hundreds of bodies on an, on, a, on a yearly basis. Um, and, 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 and did it for more than 50 years. A transplant done in Virginia in the 1960s was, was, was a heart stolen from a black man who fell off of a three foot wall, a three foot wall, not 30, three foot wall, hit his head, they took him to the hospital and within 24 hours they had harvested his heart and transplanted to someone else. And again, people knew People, his family knew they didn't get permission. Probably his coworkers knew, uh, his community knew. This man hit his head, and within 24 hours, they had transplanted his heart, certified him as dead. Um, which, again, if you're in a medical community, you know that you can't have anyone certified within 24 hours. And so, again, everyone who knew about this study, this incident, sort of knew that the doctors had basically stolen this man's heart. 
And so medical science in the United States really depended on poor and, and black bodies in terms of advancement. And then you look at redlining, which was also where you kind of outlined certain areas in the city for disenfranchisement, right? And so in, in Baltimore, they would do redlining. Blacks should be quarantined in isolated slums in order to reduce the incidence of civil disturbance and to prevent the spread of communicable diseases to nearby white neighborhoods and to protect property values amongst the white majority. And so they would they would uh, redline certain areas, I'm sure certain areas in Cleveland and in Baltimore and in Boston and in New York. And this was all done with, um, you know, with 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 um, um, disadvantaged franchises. You, the banks won't give you a housing loan. They won't they won't invest in businesses. They won't invest in schools. And so that's how we end up with the poverty that we have because redlining, again, reads, leads to housing decline, predatory lending, property value loss, and all that leads to foreclosure, vacancy, crime, health problems, and then asset loss and, 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 and less tax base. And so when, when people say, we look into inner cities and say, you know, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you know, why stop the crime, stop all that. Well, the redlining started this whole process. So there's no generational wealth. There's no, there's no, when people who have their houses in, in, in suburbs can, can leave the value of their house to the next generation, they may use that for education, for college, or defer uh, the buying of another house. But the people who are in this redlined area had houses they couldn't refinance. If any, if anything took a bump, they would lose the house. And then again, no, no generational wealth and, and no reinvestment in the community. And that's how we ended up with a lot of with the problems that we have now. So those trust issues with redlining, which again, government run, uh, Tuskegee, um, you know, public health sponsored, all those things have impacted how African Americans look at the establishment, how they look at the government, the hospital, public health, the, the board of health, big companies, you know, anything. And so that that jaded trust is is we're seeing the results of that right now. And even you know, the American Medical Association in 2008 said it finally apologized for its racist past. It was apologizing for how it discriminated against um, Black doctors and Hispanic Latino doctors and Asian doctors in Cleveland and across the country. And so I, people ask me where I was born in Cleveland. I was born at Forest City Hospital, which I'm sure there's an exhibit for at the Western Reserve Historical Society. Forest City Hospital was a Black hospital because my mother had a Black uh, um, uh, OB. And he couldn't have he couldn't admit patients to Mount Sinai or Cleveland Clinic. And so again, if you see African Americans not born at those major hospitals because their their, their parents doctors were not allowed in there, and and even in February of last year, uh, the CEO of the American Medical Association said they're still dealing with the, what they did is uh, in, in those many years, and they're still trying to reckon with you know all the the goodness that that being a physician sort of puts forward yet it was all tainted with this uh, racial slant and so and 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 you know why because you the, you have to admit that you did wrong in order to move past from it you know it's important it's still in the past but you've got to admit it so you can reckon with it so you can say why did we do that so you can have an attempt to try to not do that again so again we have African Americans studies after study after study, and, and we see it with you know COVID vaccinations and other things, distrust, 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 but it's earned. It's 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 it was earned, it was well earned, right? And so now we're getting this the dysfunctional outcomes going forward where it's really impacting us across the board and costing everyone money. So again, the poor adherence to prescribed medicines and older adults is potentially, you know, people's keeping people from getting the benefit of, of their medications. And I still have patients who aren't sure they want to take their medicine, not sure they trust me 100% to, 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 to look out for them and that I'm not more of a doctor than I am a black man or whatever. And so it, it's still, it's still that there's, they're still not 100% trusting. And this med, but this medication non adherence and, and, and order non adherence is leading to this increased risk for a stroke and heart disease and kidney failure and all those things, those bad outcomes that we continue to pay for.
So the American Heart Association put out a, a paper in 2017 that looked at African American health, and they said, you know, these populations, we were doing great, making great strides in decreasing heart attacks and strokes across our population, but we're, African Americans aren't seeing enough of that, that the benefit that, that's out there. And nearly across every metric, African Americans have the poorer cardiovascular outcomes than non-Hispanic whites. And so 1.4% sorry, 1.4 fold increase in hypertension, two fold increase in heart disease, two fold increase in heart failure, and three to four increased risk for stroke, which is significant. And then this was struck me that cardiovascular uh, African Americans are at 45 at age 45, you're five times as likely to experience an intracerebral hemorrhage. 45, five times as likely. And so I, it was struck me um, that uh, Representative T T Stephanie Tubbs Jones um, died uh, 58 of a, of a hemorrhage. That that you know, and so it's just like um, you know, what the loss is. What what would she have accomplished if she's you know, I'm I'm a couple years older than her now, and I'm not ready to go anywhere. What could she have accomplished over these over these last many years if she had not had that had that hemorrhage? And so again, hypertension's a cause in 90 percent of of those strokes. And so um, again, tr being able to control blood pressure, know it's there, you know, not be afraid to go and see a provider to get it diagnosed not be afraid to take their medicine in order to bring their blood pressure down and then be able to, pre to uh, prevent a lot of bad outcomes. And so, and hypertension, this study shows that it's far more common in African-Americans. It's two to three more times as, 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 as common. And so at age, a black male at age 55, 75% of them have hypertension. 75% of a black woman at age 55, so three out of four black men and black women at age 55 have hypertension compared to 55% of white men and 40% of white women. So when I see someone in the office and they don't have hypertension, that's I'm surprised, more surprised at that than I am with the um, with with people who do have hypertension. But it makes them wonder, and it also showed. That the hypertension, if you look at black men, that solid orange or brown line at, at age 30 and at age 35, 40% of, of black men at age 35 have hypertension, almost half. And so I frequently see a big burly African-American at 30 years old, his blood pressure is elevated. And I think, well, he's probably just nervous about being the doctor and whatnot, when in reality, is he's got hypertension and he needs to be treated because finding that hypertension earlier and treating it can prevent him from having an aneurysm 10 years later, kidney failure, heart attack, congestive heart failure. And so this study said, you know, given that these differences in hypertension between African-Americans and everyone else, we need to be really being proactive about, about being, finding, finding, you know, finding these people and getting them on the right medications. Um, so it's important to know that when you, if you are on the right medications, that there are differences in the medications. Um, um, high, uh, diuretics and calcium channel blockers tend to work better in African Americans. Um, and so those are the medications of choice. And this study just sort of showed that African Americans tend to not be put on the right medications that, that, that um, research outcomes have proven we're better in African Americans. So providers, I lecture to providers all the time, providers need to know that those nuanced differences in the treatment of hypertension apply to African Americans, put them on the right medications because a third of us as providers are not doing that, okay? And so it's important that, you know, when an African American wants to take the right med medication, that a provider is there to choose the right one that research has shown provides better outcomes. Um, again, an article showing the, the blue is African Americans have far higher heart failure and no matter uh, and far higher diabetes. Again, the, the top line showing the incidence at all going down, but it shows us further away from the pack in terms of uncontrolled diabetes and hospitalizations related to that. And then this just shows, you know, uncontrolled diabetes and complications, no matter how much money you make, the lowest the left it shows the lowest uh, paid, the lowest socioeconomic status, and the fourth Q4 shows the highest. So I'm a doctor. I'm probably in the highest uh, socioeconomic status, and I still have much higher rate 
of having uncontrolled diabetes and complications being in the hospital than the poorest white person. And so when people say these outcomes are related to poverty or, or, or uh, you know, disenfranchisement, I can show them something like this and say still as, a, as a, um, an upper class African American, I'm still not as well off as the lowest class um, white, white person. So, so um, there are also racial differences as I, as I come around to a, to a conclusion in terms of the screening for um, colon cancer. That starts at 45, not 50. And so when I ask residents, when do they start screening for colon cancer, they'll frequently say 50. And the recommendation has been 45 for the last almost 20 years for African-Americans, but people just don't know. And many of us don't know that we're supposed to, we don't start at 50. We start at 45 because of the increased burden of colon cancer compared to everyone else. You see that in the yellow, compared to everyone else, much higher rate of colon cancer. Prostate cancer, 19 per 100,000 for whites, 44, over again, over twice for that. And just to give you a, a, a reference for COVID-19, uh, 52 per 100,000. So that's why everyone was getting so excited about COVID-19, but it's still just higher than the prostate cancer risk for African-American men. And, and there again, you see the, in the yellow uh, prostate cancer, much higher for African-American men than anyone else. And those, and those of you who, who are African-American know that relatives and friends that have died from prostate cancer. And so the PSA, which is a lab test, is a great test for, for screening for, Af for, um, for prostate cancer. Doesn't involve doing a rectal exam or violating anyone. It's just a blood test. It's, it's better. And, and the course of prostate cancer in African-Americans is worse. It tends to grow faster. It tends to spread faster. And the risk from death, again, across all socioeconomic status is much higher. And so again, we wanna be screening patients with PSAs, screening African-American men with those high risks that I just showed you with, with a PSA. But again, what is, what is the, the market says, stop checks in PSA because the levels are so low. Well, they're low in white Americans and in Asian Americans and in Hispanic Latino Americans, but they're high in African Americans, but a provider who doesn't know is gonna to listen to these and say, I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna stop screening for prostate cancer and not know the little parenthetical statement that says, except in high risk populations, which African Americans are high risk. So again, we wanna spend time establishing trust with, with, with you know, recognizing the transgressions that the medical society has done to African Americans and other minorities, um, recognize the genetic and epigenetic differences. And so that's that treatment with hypertension or screening for, for prostate cancer. And then you make sure it's evidence-based. It's not, we're not just pulling stuff out of the air, but that we're, this is the thing that research has shown that research has, has demonstrated the benefit in this population and sort of we sort of apply that. And so um, that's the, um, the, the, the sense of what I've, what's what I've got. I've got my stop share. I wanna uh, be able to um, come and, and um, I think I'm right, I'm at 40, 40 minutes. I know I went fast to see if I could um, uh, answer any questions if there were any uh, or any issues. I'd like to start, Dr. Hall, by thanking you for um, a really informative presentation. And, uh, and I must say it's uh, more than a little alarming and maybe that's the point, you know, to <laughs> let folks know um, how serious these matters are. But then um, the other part of this discussion suggests that if we pay attention to what the research is saying to us, there's something we can do about it, not only to improve the quality of life, for African Americans, but also to benefit the larger society, uh, certainly in saving money in the right. long run on the cost of health care. But did I get that right? You did. You did. I mean, that's why I, I was trying to show why it's important, you know, because a lot of times people think, well, they're 13% of the population, but yeah, you yeah. know, how, how much can damage can they do to Ohio's budget? Well, you see a, a lot, right? And, and if we ignore the data that's out, it's in everyone's, but just like with COVID, it was, it's in everyone's best interest for everyone to be vaccinated as quickly as possible, but it didn't happen. So we've got virgin three and virgin four and Omicron and Epsilon, you know I mean? Because the virus kept mutating because it was able to spread from person to person. And, and, and there's no one to blame, but, but this history, right? There's, there's, there's you know, it, so I, again, I don't alienate, I, my patients, I have a ton of patients that aren't vaccinated. 
I'm not mad at them because I understand. I understand why they don't trust. Why you know why you wouldn't just run out and do it? I get. It. I tried to try my best to advocate for doing it, but I, I get it when people don't trust because it's just an overwhelming evidence. It's like when you look at all this, you have to ask yourself, why would you trust an establishment that could do these things? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and and then and so we have to overcome that. So again, what I try to then say, well, but you've got a black president of the of the Cuyahoga County Board of Health. So I'm there making sure we're not we're not gaming you as far as the vaccination we we're coming to to underserved populations and we're coming out and and i, I had some of my patients say well that you know that made me nervous you all were, came out in the superior and huff i i didn't know if i liked that well you never came out there before <laughs> so i was like i can't win right <laughs> you, you know because we we made we were delivered about trying to get it to uh, populations that need and then they they were suspicious of that even so it's it's um you know it's it's a it's a hard time but but with time you can build you can rebuild trust with time right and time and energy right and so we're we're putting time and energy into you know you know sharing this information because if you share the transgressions and then say but but we're changing we're we're trying we see the error of our ways in some small way and and we're trying to make things better.